subjective factors like how the car looks and you know the styling right and the <laughs> every, everything else right if you just need a car for a ride share basically within reason comparably yeah. Exactly, exactly. And this is just an example, mm -hmm. right? Not everyone's going to want a Malibu, of course. Yep. Um, so, um, but just to use a, you know, a, a comparative example. Uh, so you give a pretty big Delta, yep. right? I mean, it's definitely more than $10,000 of Delta. So the federal tax credit uh, is $7,500. Mm -hmm. And now that is not available for every car right. currently, right? Because it started to phase out for, for GM and for Tesla already. Um, but let's let's just for this example, let's say you know you've got the federal tax credit seventy five hundred. Then you have uh, some state level uh, incentives. So in Colorado, right, there's this state level tax credit. That's uh, it was five thousand last year. It's four thousand this year. California has a rebate, which is twenty five hundred. Mm -hmm. So it sort of depends on where you are in terms of you know yeah. uh, how many incentives you can sort of stack on top of each other and how much they're worth. But you're still talking you know a delta of at least a few thousand yeah. dollars between one and the other. Now, with the gas savings and the maintenance savings, you know, we we are seeing drivers who are currently saving somewhere between fifty and seventy dollars a week, mm. in, in some cases, on fuel savings alone. So, if you kind of do the math there, you know, you will get a payback uh, on that upfront cost after a couple of years, but that's still tough, yeah. right? It's still tough to put out a couple extra thousand dollars and wait a couple of years to get paid back. So what we're trying to do, and this is really where our commitment, where, where sort of the rubber meets the road, mm -hmm. is that it, it's up to us uh, to work with auto manufacturers to uh, aggregate the demand of all the drivers on the platform and help the auto manufacturers to see that, hey, there's, there's actually a lot of demand here and therefore they need to increase the supply. And we all know, right, from Economics 101 that if you increase the supply, the cost tends to come mm -hmm. down. Um, so we wanna to help to aggregate that demand, help to bring the cost down of, of the upfront cost of the car and work with charging providers to allow access uh, to similarly aggregate that demand and you know, buy electricity in, in bulk, so to speak, um, work with utilities to get more charging yeah. stations uh, installed. So we, we want to kind of uh, go after all the different pain points that currently exist for EV driving today, and, and it don't get me yeah. wrong, it is not you know the best experience you could possibly have today. There's a lot of work yeah. to do, um, so that's what we're trying to do to help make it a, a really uh, a really compelling value proposition for drivers, so that people will basically be you know leaping out of their seats to say, why wouldn't I drive an EV? Yeah. It's going to save me money if there's enough charging, you know, et cetera, et cetera, then people will want to. And that's the state that we want to get to. Yeah. And so it sounds like sort of right now, there's that at least a few thousand dollar cost difference, depending on the manufacturer that you're purchasing from and the state and federal rebates available. You know, that's sort of the minimum, which is going to be maybe a one to two year break even period at a minimum. Uh, who, what type of driver do you think, uh, you know, an EV kind of makes the most sense for? I mean, I, I guess I'm thinking, you know, like for those who don't know, you know, I mean, a full-time driver might put a thousand miles a week on their car. So is it just someone who's sort of the more miles, the better at this point, or maybe there's specific states or, you know, like, like you said, right, I guess a state where you can maximize the state rebate, but also the federal rebate. And then you would have to buy a car that, uh, you know, where that, the rebate hasn't phased out yet. Right. I guess that's maybe like the ideal person, um, to buy an electric car or situation. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. We did a little bit of analysis over the summer, mm -hmm. um, and we actually looked at uh, some individual, you know, driving patterns, just sort of see like some real world examples. Yeah. And what we found is that um, there are some drivers, oh, right, we probably all know this, right? There's some drivers who drive a, a lot of miles that might be driving full time, uh, could be up to, you know, 30, 40, maybe in some cases even 50,000 miles a year. Mm -hmm. Um, and other drivers who are doing this uh, part time and are maybe just doing, you know, a few thousand miles of rideshare driving a year might, might not be much at all. Um, we actually found that there are many drivers in each of those groups hmm. who could use an EV today just based upon the mileage that they're doing. Now, that doesn't take into account, you know, is there a charging station yeah. right near my home or right near my, you know, grocery store or whatever. So that, that's sort of another layer of analysis that we would have to do. but. Um, but what we found is that actually for those who are not doing a lot of miles per year, there are some good options like, in fact, uh, used Nissan Leafs, hmm. right, which have you know something like 100 miles of range, but you can get it for just a few thousand dollars in some cases if it's a three or four year old model. Um, and uh, on the other side of the spectrum, for those who are driving, uh, you know, very high amounts of mileage per year, uh, in that case, a car 
like, let's say, a Chevy Bolt, which has, I think, as you said, something like 220, 230 miles of range, um, can actually cover something like 95 to 99 percent of the driving days that you might be doing. Mm -hmm. So sure, there's going to be one day out there where you get a really long trip, you know, to the next state over or something. Yeah. Um, but if you put those, you know, outlier examples to the side, yeah. uh, it's really the vast majority of miles of, of driving days that, that can be done by many drivers. Yeah. Well, I also imagine that, you know, going back to that cross-functional, there may be, I'm curious if you've looked into opportunities to work with, say, the product teams at Lyft to understand that, hey, you know, if we have a certain percentage of drivers that are on electric vehicles, we probably don't want to send them, you know, a bunch of long trips, or maybe there's a way to opt right. in or opt out or, you know, understand right. or even understand that, like, hey, this is the type of car they're driving. We know the range so that as the day, you know, gets to the end, right, like if they start if we assume they started with a full tank, we can't send them anything over 75 miles, you know, at the end of their shift. I'm, I'm curious if you've looked into any of those types of uh, product uh, opportunities. Right. Certainly those things are, are very important and, and will be very important. The more EV drivers that are on the platform, mm -hmm. um, those conversations are just starting now. So, you know, we're, we're still, we're still in the early days here. Um, you had asked earlier, you know, how many EVs are there on the platform? It, today, it's well less than 1% of, of cars mm -hmm. are electric. Um, so it's still small. Um, we're still at the, in the really beginning On the Lyft platform, here. less than 1%. What's on that? the Lyft platform, less than 1%? On the Lyft yeah. platform. Okay. Yes, Lyft platform. Um, so certainly those features will need to be built. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it wouldn't be a good yeah. EV driving experience if you... Get, it, get end up getting stuck with a yeah. really long ride at the very end of the day. Yeah. But I guess so, what you're saying at the same time, you have to balance the considerations for the 99% of the other drivers who, you know, may probably have tons of features and, you know, products and services that they want. Um, are there any other big, uh, I guess, opportunities that you see in the near future to sort of, I guess, you know, within the lift fleet accelerate, I guess that's a question. So what's like the biggest near term opportunity to get that number, you know, increasing and up from 1%? The nearest opportunity that we think we have is to actually focus on the express drive rental program. <clears throat> and the reason it gets back to something we were talking about earlier, which is the highest mileage drivers will have faster paybacks mm -hmm. right, on, on the slightly higher cost of the EV because the savings, uh, you save them, you, you save money basically every mile driven. Yeah. Right? You save on maintenance, you save on fuel. So that means those who drive the highest number of miles are gonna save the fastest. And it's actually the express drive vehicles, the rental vehicles that tend to be some of the highest mileage vehicles that there are, right? right? Because people are deliberately rent, you know, yeah. going out and renting a vehicle so that they can do ride sharing, they're gonna drive a I lot. I think they right? get unlimited mileage too, so <laughs> it's nice. Yeah, right. Um, so the first area of focus is gonna be continuing to work on the express drive program right. because we can help drivers to achieve those mm -hmm. savings more quickly and make the economics work more quickly. Yeah. And that we think that'll create kind of a positive feedback loop where, you know, that will create some new demand for electric vehicles, which then will help auto manufacturers to, you know, mm -hmm. send it, send a signal to them basically that they need to create more supply, bring the cost down. And then as the cost comes down, that will help drivers who drive slightly fewer miles per year electrify economically. And once they've done it, yeah. that'll help bring the cost down even more. So it'll sort of, we think it'll sort of leapfrog from the highest mileage drivers okay. to the next highest mileage to the next highest mileage, et cetera. Yeah. So definitely starting with the highest mileage drivers makes sense. I guess the sort of, you know, leapfrogging between, you know, okay, we've got now a few hundred drivers and then going to the EVs, that seems like it would take uh, quite a while, right? Especially knowing the automotive, you know, product cycles, right? Like usually they're, you know, four to five years <laughs> in the making for their next vehicles or their supply. Um, so I imagine that, uh, I, I don't know, I guess I'm curious, are you relying on that much? Or, you know, I guess the other big piece to me seems like the government incentives, right? Because, I mean, I guess there's still the break-even period, but, you know, a one to two break even pe year break-even period is very reasonable, um, but that's also with pretty big, you know, majority government incentives, right? So how, how do those government incentives play in? And I'm assuming you're a big fan of those. Um, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts there. Yes. So in terms of the incentives, um, so of course we, we know that there's the federal incentive and as we talked about it, it has already phased out for GM cars and for Tesla cars. Right. Um, so who does that leave are... just by the way, like what are the big, you know, EV makers after that? Nissan, Leaf? Yeah, well actually in 
that's exactly what I was going to say next. So, um, what what we're seeing in terms of the you know number of models out there is that as of right now, as of today, mm -hmm. September first, uh, there are not tons of different EV models out there. Yeah. However, starting in the 2021 model year, which is starting right mm -hmm. now, basically, and going into the 2022 and 2023, right there are a number of manufacturers, particularly uh, European manufacturers like Volkswagen and others, who have already announced that they're planning to introduce a number of new EV models. So I think what we're going to see in the next couple of years actually is sort of a maybe explosion is the right yeah. word, but you know, a, a lot of new models um, be introduced. And I think that's going to create a lot of choice, a lot of variety. Um, and, uh, and that will help to both kind of allow people to, to regain access to the federal tax credit, which will not have yet expired for those manufacturers. Um, and it will just create competition in the marketplace, right? So there's going to be, a, uh, I think, a positive cycle there yeah. where we're going to have a lot more choice and a lot more options available. Yeah.